All right, so we'll allocate about maybe 30 minutes or so to, uh, to an example. Another example of recursion, look at some code, and then we will go over coverage for exam number two. All right, so as we noted, recursion, right, in application, in the sense of computer programming, is when we're defining a function or an algorithm in terms of itself. Like more generally, we're defining a process right, or a sequence in terms of itself. And this is all right as long as we have a way to stop this recursive nature, as long as we have a base case, a way to stop this recurrence. Right, we noted that there are many processes, algorithms that are inherently repetitive, right, inherently recursive. One of them was the factorial function. Right. Factorial of n, for example, right, can be defined to be equal to simply factorial of n minus 1 right, times n. Right, again, in a sense, we're defining this function in terms of itself. We're solving this factorial problem in terms of solving a smaller factorial problem, in a sense. Right, another example of this was our Fibonacci sequence. Right, we could compute the nth version of, or the nth index in the Fibonacci sequence right, by computing the two previous right, indices of the Fibonacci sequence. All right. Today we're going to do one last example where uh, we'll show that we can use recursion in many other applications, not just numerically, mathematically here, but we can use recurrence in, in any situation where we can define an algorithm or a procedure in terms of itself. Right? This happens quite a bit in computer science, and we'll use an example with linked lists since we've become familiar with linked lists. Right? So we'll go ahead and look at linked lists. And first we'll look at it visually, and then we'll look at it in an in a algorithmic or, a pre, pre, um, or as a process or procedure. Right? And then we'll go ahead and look at some code and see how we can implement a recursive algorithm on linked lists. Right. So for example, right, let's say we have a linked list here. Right? And we'll use our standard drawing here of our linked list with our nodes, right, which have the two major fields. Right. And we, of course, have our head pointer, which is going to point to the first item in our linked list. And then our linked list is a linked list because it's linked, right? The nodes or our links in the chain are linked. So we have our pointers here that point to each of the nodes in the chain. Let's say we want to add a node to this chain. Let's say we want to add it to the end. Right. So we defined a function that was add node to end. or add to back, right? We defined it so that we would feed in the head, right? We needed to feed in the head. Here, I'm gonna drop some of the C++ syntax and keep it a little informal, right? And then we'll, we want to add the node to add. All right, and essentially what we had to do to add a node to the end, we identified that we had to first create the node that we wanted to add. Right, and then we had to traverse, right? We had to iterate, right? Down our list until we got to the end of our list. And then of course we would then, once we got to the last node currently in the list, we would change its next pointer to point to the new node in the list, thus making it the last node in the list, thus successfully completing this add to back of node or add a node to back of list. Right, one thing to notice here, is that we do have repetition, we do have iteration, and in essentially all instances where we have some sort of repetitive nature, repetition, iteration, right? We can code this up using recursion. Sometimes it's fairly intuitive, sometimes it's not quite as intuitive. Here we have a fairly clear recurrence though. That is we can define this add node to end function in terms of add node to end. Right. That is, we could define, let's say add node to end. I'll just say A N T E. This will make it a little bit easier. Right? Add node to end. 
right, of the current head, right, and node to add, I'll just call them head and node, right, can be defined as, right, is the same as adding the node to the end of the list that begins at head's next node. Let's view this conceptually. Right. Again, as long as we define our appropriate base case, a way to stop this repetition, this inherent recurrence, right? This, right, this definition is valid. Right. And why is it valid? Well, we're saying that the problem of adding a node to the end of the list, this list here, right, that begins with head, is the same as right, adding a node to the end of the list that begins at head's next Right? which is the same as adding a node to the end of the list that begins at heads next next, right? which is the same as adding a node to the end of the list that begins at heads next next next, right? which is the same as adding, right? and you keep doing this until we hit some sort of base case where we would stop this recurrence. Right. So again, one way to see recursion is that we are taking a, a larger problem right, and solving it using the same procedure, but on a smaller subset of the problem or a smaller version of the problem. Like here, we have a, an initial problem of adding a node to the end of a list that begins at head. And we're saying simply that this is the same as adding a node to the end of the list that begins at head's next node, right? which is the same as adding a node to the end of the list that begins at head's next next node, right? and so on and so forth. All right, again, our same recurrence, the same idea with our Fibonacci sequence right? and our factorial function. And so let's see how we can get this done in code. Before we proceed, are there any questions about this concept here? All right. Let's pull up. Right, so here I've added some extra, right, an extra function to our, right, to our linked list example. So let's pull this up. Let me change it so it's also being recorded here. All right. All right. So here's our standard version, our iterative version of adding a node to the back of our list. All right, so how can we get this done? Well, again, we need to know the head of the list, right? And we need to know the node to add. So this function is gonna have two parameters. We need to know these two items. Otherwise, right, we, we must know where the, the current list and we must know the node that we're adding to the list. So these are two necessary parameters for this function. In our iterative version, we need to use an iterator node, which would be initialized at the head of the list. And then we would iterate by changing the iterator node to be its next field. So iterator equals iterator next, or the node pointing, right, the node after the iterator node. And we would continue to do that. So of course we have our first check here to make sure that we're not gonna get a null pointer. Right, then we iterate down our list. We say iterators, uh, while we don't reach the end of the list, while iterator node's next field is not null, iterator node equals iterator node not next. Again, just hopping along the linked list, right, traversing the chain, Right, once iterator node's next field is equal to null, that means we've, we're now currently pointing to the last node in the current list. And so we break out of this loop, and then we say iterator node's next field equals node to add, thus connecting that node to add via the next field pointer, right, and thus adding this final node to the chain at the end. Right, as we just noticed in our previous example, right, this is inherently recursive as well. That is, we can solve this problem, adding node to the end of list, right, by adding a node to the end of the list that begins at head's next field. All right, so here I'll go ahead and remove right, the answers here. But there are three main cases here if we wanted to create a recursive version of this function. Right, again, we need to know the head of the list, the current head of the list. 
and the node that we're going to add to the list. Right. In this particular instance, we have two base cases. Again, one of them to stop the recurrence and one of them to stop right, essentially a null pointer. Right. So there's two separate base cases and one recursive case. Right here, if our list is empty, right, we can't refer to head's next field. And right? so we're going to have this extra base case to make sure we don't get a null pointer. Right. If, if our list is currently empty, right, how do we add node to add to our list? We just simply assign that value to the head itself. Right? It's the first and last node in the list. It is the head of the list. And so we can do that by simply saying head equals node to add. If our list is not initially empty, right, then we're going to have the following recurrence. Right? We're going to have a way to stop the recurrence here, our base case. And this will be our base case. Right, and then here we'll have our recurrence, our recursive case. All right, so what is our recursive case here? What is add to back going to be equal to? Right, add back of head and node to add. How can we, how can we syntactically say that this is the same as adding <coughs> node to add to the back of the list that begins at head's next field? or where head's next field is pointing. And so here is our recursive case. So we are going to add, we are going to invoke this function in its own body, in its own definition. So add to back, right? Underscore R for a recursive case. Right, so how can we say that we want to add this node to the back of the list that begins at head's next field, syntactically speaking? Do you guys think about that for a moment? All right, what do you guys think? How should we invoke add to back here in our recursive case? If we want to traverse down the list, if we want to add a node to the back of the list, beginning at head's next field, how can we do that? Oh, everyone's extra shy today. Right, so the problem of adding right, a node to the back of the list beginning at head and ending at node or beginning at head with the node to add right, is the same as adding a node to the back of the list right, that begins at head's next field, <laughs> noting right, with our node to add. And this is again just the same definition we wrote when we were writing up on the chalkboard. Right? Adding a node to the end of a list that begins at head is the same as adding a node to the end of the list that begins at head's next field. Right? Again, and if we just keep recurring, keep doing that, right? the next iteration, right? the next scope, right? the next time this function is invoked, we're going to go to head's next, next field, right? and then head's next, next, next field. That's along the chain. However, we need to have an appropriate place to stop. We can't keep going along the chain. We'll, get, we'll eventually hit a null pointer. So what we can do here is simply say that, right, when head's next field is equal to null, that means head is currently pointing to the last node in the list. Right, then we can say head's right, next field right, is equal to node to add, thus adding, right, thus adding node to add to the end of the list. Any questions about that? All right. Let's check out, let's see an illustration of this and why this is working. 
Let's say we currently have a list which has a couple of items in it, let's say. Let's say three items. Let's start with three. All right, and let's say we want to add four. So we'll say add. All right, it's node. Let's use, let's do a little shorthand here. All right, so we'll say add. <coughs> Node two n, right? Of this list beginning at head. So we'll say this is the initially head. And add the node four. So here I'm mixing, right, in this particular illustration, I'm actually illustrating the operands. And so here we're passing in the head of this list as the first operand, right? And the pointer to this node as the second operand in this functional notation. Does everyone sort of understand this illustration? Make sense? Okay. All right, so what do we say here? Well, if we go into the body of this function, right, we check head is not equal to null. Heads.next is not equal to null. So what are we going to do? We're going to say this is equal to adding the node to the end of the list starting at head's next field. So what do we do? Right, again, if we see this as a scoping diagram, and we're then going to call another function, right, which is the same function, add node to head, or add node to end, excuse me of the list that begins at head's next field. So the list that begins at two, three, right? and our node to add four. Right, make sense? And similarly, we'll go through the code in this particular scope, and we will reach the same conditional, the recursive case, and because head's next field is not null, head's next field is pointing to three. So what do we say in our recursive case? We say add back, right? Add node to back of head's next field. So it's the same. Adding four to the back of this list is the same as adding four to the back of the list that begins at three. Right now, when we go through our conditional here, we hit our base case, right? Because our list is just of size one, right? This is currently the head in the scope, in this sublist, or in our small list. So heads next field is now equal to null. Right? This is the end of the list, and its next field is pointing down or pointing to null. All right. So in this particular case, we simply say heads next field should now point to the node to add. And so in this particular scope, we then update our, our list right, by performing right, this particular right, link. Since we're dealing with pointers, right, again, this is an illustration, all of these nodes are on the, are on the heap. Right? We've just been copying pointers, not the actual nodes themselves. Right? So the three object, the three node, the next field is now pointing to four. Right? We then break out of that else part and then hit the end of the function, return back, return back, return back. There's nothing to return. And it's empty returns, it's a void function. Right? But the link has been made, the damage has been done, four has been added to the back of the list. Right? And we are complete. Any any questions about how how that works out? Right. Again, the idea here is that the very simple idea, the very simple recurrence is that adding a node to the back of a list that begins at head is the same as adding a node to the back of a list that begins at the next node of the list. Right. All right. All right, so that is the last example for recursion. So at this point, we can go ahead and review for exam number two. Any questions about recursion in general, this particular example, or any of our previous examples? Ask now or forever hold your peace until office hours or when I check my email.
Okay, yeah. Will there be like a section on the test where like we have, like, like in the coding section, is there gonna be any questions where like we have to do the coding? It is possible. What, what, uh, what is more likely is that I may have a recursive function and I will ask you to explain what it's doing or to perform the calculation that it's doing. Right. I may ask you to write a recursive function. The, rec the recursive function that I might ask you to write would be fairly basic if so, but that is possible for that. But you should certainly at least know how to read recursive functions, follow, trace out this, the function invocation chain, the function call chain, trace out the scope diagram, however you want to visualize it, however you want to keep it organized in your mind, how the sequence of execution is proceeding. Right? Uh, make sure at the very least you can read it well and that you could write a fairly simple recursive function at best. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what point in this code are we having the next field of third level? Yeah. All right here. And so when we get to our third, the first two instances, right, in these first two scopes when the function is called, right, uh, we hit the recursive case. Right. And in this scope here, right, 10 in this scope, right, our sub list head of this list is three. It's next field, it points into null because it's just a list of size one. So we go into this base case here, the second base case. And in this particular base case, we say heads next field is equal to node to add. So this assigns, right, you know, illustratively, we perform that last connection. And then we are passing pointers, and right? this is uh, another reason. It's good to pass you know, another uh, one of the reasons um, we, we took the time to discuss pointers. Right? Uh, passing pointers here from from scope to scope. Right? We chase the pointers because these items are actually on the on the heap, and then made this connection right, to the actual node that contains the and the node that contains four. Right? There's no copies of nodes in these scopes because we're only passing pointers from scope to scope. <coughs> Good questions. Any other questions? All right, so these are these are good questions and, and things that may pop up on an exam as well is this understanding, you know, memory allocation, dynamic allocation, right? Pass by copy, pass by reference. What happens when you pass pointers? When is it necessary? When is it necessary to pass by reference? Right? When would it be beneficial to pass by reference or pass by pointer or pass by copy? In what situation would you never want to pass by copy? Right. You should have a good understanding of these, not just in context to just link the list, but just uh, the high-level concept of when it is appropriate to uh, to pass parameters right in either either of these ways. All right. If there's no further questions about recursion, we'll go ahead and go item by item, topic by topic. That will be covered on exam two. I'll try to give you a general idea of what to expect. Uh, if you have questions as we go through it, though, please please ask them. Now is the best time for that. All right, I'm not passing out a practice exam, but I do strongly encourage you to go over the practice problem set right, that I Right, that I emailed out. Right? You can also find it in the announcements area if you've deleted that email. There's a practice problem set which has a number of problems from each of the chapters that we covered. Right? I went through and selected key ones, ones that would get you well prepared for exam number two. Right? It's very likely you will see questions similar to those that you will find on the practice set. So I encourage you to become very comfortable with those types of questions, the concepts covered in those questions. Right? And as always, well, at least uh, respective to our previous exam, I think you should expect the same format for the exam. There may be a small true-false area or section. There may be a small multiple choice area section, and then there may be some uh, variations of short answers and or coding. Right? As with exam number one, you should certainly be comfortable with coding from scratch. And right? so it's, uh, especially with some of these new concepts, object-oriented programming, linked lists, uh, make sure that you can certainly code these things from scratch when given a blank piece of paper. Right? Also, make sure that you can, if when reading over code, you can identify errors, identify issues, 
whether they're syntactic errors, logical errors, uh, or runtime errors. Yeah. So we should be able to like code the linked list like just like from scratch. Yeah. Yeah. Or we should like, be able like, to like a basic linked list, like not like a super hard one. <laughs> a very hard. I will be taking time into into consideration with the exam. So uh, I would not expect you to be able to code up an entire linked list class. Uh, what you may expect to do is maybe code up one one function, like one member method, or overload one operator for the class, right? Or or any class for that matter, not just linked list. I encourage you to familiarize yourself with linked list. These types of questions. Were, are beneficial in that they test your understanding of not only classes and object-oriented programming, but also linked list the structure themselves. So we should have like the syntax of like the overloading or Right, so each of the operators, this is a good question, uh, each of the operators has their own, their own uh, structure, their own parameter list, their own syntax. So I do not expect you guys to memorize all of them for all the different operators and all the different ways you can use the operators. Right, so I'll at least provide you with a stub, right? So you can see, you know, what what the parameters are whenever you try to overload an operator of that type. Right? And so you'll just have to know the basic idea that if the operator is a unary operator or a binary operator, that there's there might be just one parameter in the parameter list, right, or two, right? Uh, or there might just be one in the parameter list, but there's still two operands, so you'd have to know to use the this keyword, right? And so just have a basic understanding of operator overlo overloading in general and Understand the operator as well. Is there one operand, two operands? How is it going to be used? <coughs> yeah. Um, do I do not have answers for the practice problems. However, if you have any question as to whether they are as to whether they are uh, your answers, your solutions are correct or not, you can of course always test them. Right, uh, by simply coding them up and checking them out. Uh, if you have any questions about any of the, the questions, right, you can come see me in my office hours or, or any of the TAs in their office hours as well. Yeah. Would you mind opening up on Blackboard so we can see the answers to the class homework? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what the answer is, but I think it's just in the past homeworks. Uh, also, again, with respect to that, I'm, I'm going to keep the homeworks, uh, the homeworks, the homework answers. You can see what you've gotten wrong, right, in the in the homeworks. Do you I not can see the questions you've gotten wrong, but not the correct. Not the correct answers. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. Is it all hidden? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I will. Uh, I'll get back to you on that and see and see if I can if I can release those. I will send you send out an email and update you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so uh, with respect to coding uh, the code snippets, when I ask you to write code from scratch, uh, I'll very likely just be asking you to write a snippet. So you won't have to include things like preprocessor directives or main methods or, or any, any other include files or anything like that. And good questions. Any, any other uh, general questions before we go sort of topic by topic here? Uh, my office hours today are going to begin uh, a little bit before 6, maybe a quarter to 6, and will end at 7.30. All right. I may also be opening up an extra set of office hours this weekend. It's possible. I'll send you guys an email. Okay. All right, so the, one of the big things we've covered right, is a huge paradigm shift in coding altogether. Right, we started our our object-oriented programming. So right, this is this is big. This is going to be a huge chunk of exam number two. And right, object-oriented programming. Right, the design, right, the scheme of of coding, right, the organization of your code, right, has significantly changed as compared to functional or sequential programming. Right, in object-oriented programming, we Introduce the ideas of information hiding and encapsulation. So know, understand these concepts, understand why we have member variables and why by default they're preferred to be private.
right? Also understand member methods, right? Member methods, right? Member variables. These are the two main constituents of a class. Right? This is the template, right, for the class, and an object is an instance of the class. And our member variables, right, and member methods. And understand the idea or understand the difference between defining a member method inline or using the scoping operator right, to define it uh, outside of the class definition. Right? But it's important to understand the basic definitions uh, and the basic nomenclature used with classes and uh, with classes, objects, classes, instances of objects, or instances of classes, excuse me, member variables, member methods, inline member methods, or using the scope operator, right, the class scope operator. All right, we also discussed a few more things related to classes. And some more advanced topics, including the, this keyword. And if you understand the, the idea of having objects and that these objects are the only way we can invoke a member method of a class, that the, this keyword is simply a pointer to the object that's currently invoking the member method. So understand not only how to use the this keyword, but understand what it is, right, and why it works in this particular programming scheme. All right, we also talked about uh, a number of uh, a number of other things closely related to classes. We talked about operator overloading. Right, we talked about other special functions, including the constructor, right, which is how, or which is the special function that is called to create an object of a particular class. And we also discussed the destructor, which is a function that is always implicitly called whenever an object is going to be destroyed. Right, the destructor is never explicitly called, but rather it is implicitly called whenever the whenever an object is going to be destroyed. An object will be destroyed if, number one, you explicitly destroy it by calling the delete, right, or using the delete function, or number two, if the object leaves scope. Right. Number three, some of the, early, the newer versions of C++ has a garbage collector, such that if you've not been tidy with your memory, right, the garbage collector will go around killing random objects that are no longer accessible. And right. so those are three ways that objects can be destroyed. Yeah. Um, the syntax, right, I, I would expect you to understand to be able to read a constructor. The syntax is simply, it's just like a constructor, it's the name of the class, but with a tilt, a tilt in front of it. Right. Um, and then inside of the destructor, right, generally it's the last words of that particular object. Right. If, if, there's, uh, if there's anything in particular that is stored in that object that you want to remove and uh, retain access, or maybe add it to a list or add it to something, right, that's the time to do it. Okay, so it's like the last words of that particular object. We didn't have any examples here where we had an important use of the destructor, but in O5.2 you'll encounter some areas where you want to maybe save some information before the object's destroyed. Yeah. The destructor itself that is a special function. That function is invoked implicitly. You can't call it explicitly. Like the destructor itself. And so it's just a sequence of, of um, a sequence of commands that are performed, right? a sequence of instructions that are performed when an object is about to be destroyed. Yeah. Hey, if there's nothing to be done, yeah. If there's nothing to be done, right, then you need not even write it. There's a there's a there's a default one that's empty. They can be helpful for uh, debugging purposes, as you guys have probably seen in the latest project, to make sure that you are properly deleting uh, nodes in your info list. If you put a little print statement in your destructor, you would see that, that the delete node is actually occurring at the right time if, if, uh, if you designed your test tool. And other things we discussed 
uh, copy constructors as well. Right, so we also discussed overloading the, the assignment operator. Right. Yeah, I think that, right, that might be it with respect to classes. All right. All right, so moving along, uh, function overloading. All right, we discussed operator overloading. You can overload any function, right? any function with a particular name. As long as the parameter list is different, you can have multiple functions with the same name. Right, as long as the compiler can distinguish between the, the function, it can distinguish between functions if they have right, a different number of operands, a different parameter list. Right, so an example where we saw this was constructors. Right, you could define a constructor with one parameter or, or a constructor with two parameters. But that constructor had the same name, and it was the name of the class. Right, but the compiler knows which one to call in which circumstance based on the parameters, based on the operands supplied during the invocation of the constructor. And so an example of that was having multiple constructors was a good example of function overloading. We discussed function overloading you know, in the first half of our class, but we got to see some really good examples here with our constructors. Right. And dynamic memory allocation right, and pointers were there were two big things that we also covered. So this, these are two really big and important concepts right up there with object-oriented programming. And so pointers and dynamic memory allocation. And I remember the, the example questions that I had supplied and the problem set with respect to, with respect to these topics very well. And I chose them very purposefully. You should expect to see questions on the exam very much like them. Right? So in the practice problem set, they had a number of variables. Right? And you're asked, you know, what happens when you print these variables right, to the screen? And so you would have maybe a variable p. Right? And then you would say, like, see out p. Right? And then it would say, see out star p. Right? And maybe see out ampersand p. Right? Or ampersand p. Right? And so on and so forth. Right? And so what do each of these things mean? What does the indirection operator mean? What's the referential operator mean? Right? If I were to ask, if I were to print P, what would it print? Would it print the value of P? Would it print the memory location of P? Right? Is P a pointer variable? Is it a, an int variable? Right? Understand the, right, just the overall concept of what a pointer variable is as compared to a regular variable, and right? what the referential and the indirection operators do with respect to variables. Right. We also noted, like with respect to pointers, right, pointers. Well, we also noted that arrays, right, right, are treated very much just like pointers, right, and that we use the bracket notation to indicate an offset from that pointer, right, but you can also just treat the array as a pointer explicitly, and we use the indirection operator to access values stored in the array. What's the difference between the Yeah, so they're very similar. Uh, one of the main differences between them is that the, a pointer variable is a variable that can be changed. Right? Whereas a referential operator simply just pulls the location of a variable in space. So a pointer variable is actually a variable that takes up space and stores the address of another space. Whereas a re the referential operator simply pulls like, the, um, the memory location of, of a variable. Right? Right. A referential variable can never be overwritten, can never be changed. A pointer variable can be changed. Right. right, so this is a very good example, or a very good question. Right, so in our... Right, in our linked list example, right, when we were adding a node to the back, we had both a referential and a pointer, right, the indirection and the referential operator associated with the head, right? So why did we do that? This is an excellent question, a really good test question. We 
was a good one. Add node to back was a good one. We just did that example. Add node to end. Right. And we had right, so what's pointer. And then our node to add here, which is also a pointer. All right, so why would we want to pass in right, a reference to our pointer? It's a reference to our pointer. All right. I've done it the same way again. Huh? Reference to a pointer. And so why would we want to use both right, of these operators here? Right. Well, let's, let's break this down into, into sub-problems. Why, right, why not simply do this? Right, we, star and head. Is that really? Yeah. It seems more intuitive the other way. Right? Star reference head. Hmm. Change color. Yeah. All right. So, why? And why not just pass the head in as a pointer? And this is a very this is a very good question. Right? So we'll spend some time doing this. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Not only might you change the head object itself because you might change it so that the head object is pointing, right? The the object that head is pointing to, right? It's next field. You might alter it, so you might be changing that, which is why we are passing it by pointer. Right? We don't want to pass a copy of the head. But a pointer, we want to pass where the head is located in memory, right? But in our main method, right? So here we can do a scope diagram. In our main method, right? We defined a variable, at least in our project. We just we defined a pointer variable called head, right? Right. So in this illustration, we're going to merge syntax and in imagery, right? So you can see this as you know, this place in you know, some square in memory that stores some hex address, right? we'll say AF, of where the head is located. And so this is a pointer variable called head, which is located in the main scope. If we change the head itself, right, this head is located probably somewhere on the heap. And so if we change the head itself, that's not a problem because we could just pass it by star, because we'll just chase the star and then change the actual object which is on the heap. Which is why our other operand passing it by star and many of our other operands, we only need to pass by star, because we only need to pass the reference, like right, where that item is located in memory, to change that item itself. Right? But our head, the head itself, is a pointer which is located in our main scope. Now, there's actually a place in memory in our main scope called head, which stores the address of the beginning of our list. It might be the case that we want to actually change right, head in this scope, out of scope. Now, this is a pointer in the main scope, not in our scope of add to head, but in a different scope. If we want to change the value of this pointer, the actual beginning of the list, not the node at that list, the actual beginning of the list, right, we need to pass the pointer in by reference because we actually may change the pointer value itself, not just the object itself. So we are passing in the reference, right? We're passing in the pointer by reference because we may actually change the pointer itself, not just the object. Does that make sense? Right, right. that is not your question. No question. No question. Yeah. Yeah, if the head was empty, or if the list was empty, would be the only case. Otherwise, yeah, if you're not going to change the head pointer itself, if the list is not going to be empty when you call this function, 
then you need not have the reference here. Right? You would still use the pointer, passing the pointer. And it's, it's better for a couple of reasons. Number one, so you don't copy the whole object, you're just copying a pointer and you pass the, the, the pointer <laughs> variable. Right? And, uh, and number two, if, if you were to make some changes to the object, which you may or may not do in different situations, right? if you wanted to change the next field, right, you wouldn't want to change it on the copy of the head object, but rather you would want to choose the pointer to that object. So you actually made the change on the object itself and not a copy of the object. <laughs> Yes, yes. Yeah, so these, these concepts are important to understanding and understanding these operators, not just what they do, but when to use them, why we use them, how they're related to dynamic allocation, and how they're related to pass by copy, pass by reference. Okay. Again, very, very good questions. These, these are good questions. These are the right questions to be asking. All right, so that was good. All right, so continuing along with dynamic allocation, right? Understanding at a high level when you need to allocate things on the heap dynamically, right? If you're reading something from a file, you don't necessarily know how many items are in the file. So you're, you're not going to be able to declare an array, right? You're not going to know the size of the array that you're going to need to create to store everything efficiently. And so you might want to use dynamic allocation, allocate something on the heap. And right? you can create an array on the heap and you can create linked lists, and you can, right, there's a number of solutions, right, understanding how you can create something on a heap using the new keyword, right, and how you can access these items via pointers, I think is important. And of course, we also talked about linked lists, like your first data structure. I feel that given all of our in-class examples and all of the questions and their progress through our in-class examples, you guys have a pretty firm grip of linked lists. So I encourage you to keep practicing. Make sure you uh, sort of get some of the finer details related to linked lists, such as when we need to pass uh, pointers by reference or when we can just simply pass uh, nodes by pointer. Right? Uh, and, and others and some of the other finer details related to linked lists. Again, I think you guys have a good conceptual understanding. Just make sure that you understand how to get these concepts accomplished syntactically in C++, while taking into account things such as dynamic allocation, right, and passing things by reference and or uh, by pointers. Right. So basic operations, right, the basics, and operations also include you know by finer details things such as you know making sure you're not going to have null pointers making sure that you're traversing the list correctly making sure you're using two iterator and uh, two iterator nodes when two are needed and making sure you don't sever a chain right uh, at the wrong time when you're trying to maybe uh, add something or remove something from the list make sure that you deallocate the memory at the appropriate time and right? make sure that you Patch and or detach at the appropriate time. And so again, with dynamic allocation, we need to know new, right? and we also need to know delete. Know when to use delete, why to use delete, and how we never use delete on a variable that's being allocated on the stack. What's that? Okay, yeah, so you can use delete to deallocate uh, a variable or memory that was allocated on the heap. So anything using the new keyword. Right, you've explicitly allocated on the heap, so you can use delete to explicitly deallocate it. And you don't ever want to use delete on a variable that you didn't create using new. Right, so you don't want to call delete on a variable that's local, which is stored on the stack, deleting things on the stack instead. Yeah. I know in our uh, syllabus here, we mentioned advanced strings, and I think many of you have become familiar with things like string strings. How many of you have used string strings? You read ahead string strings, no? It's not necessary. I encourage you to, to investigate string strings at some point during your curriculum. You don't really have time to go over them at this point. It's, and it's a, uh, 
it's an object in C++ or a class in C++ that makes the manipulation and use of strings a little bit easier. Parsing strings and doing various things with strings can be a bit cumbersome using the string class alone. And so there's this uh, a string stream class, and which can uh, make some of these operations a little bit more simple. You'll very likely revisit them in 052 or visit them for the first time in 052. You shouldn't, don't worry about seeing anything like that on the exam. We won't be discussing string streams on the exam. Right, and then lastly, we've covered recursion. Right, understand the basics of recursion. Right, understand that we have when coding a recursive function or when identifying or dissecting a recursive function, that right, you have the base case and the recursive case. Right, it has those two main sections, a base case. Right, as we saw, in our last example, there might be more than one base case, recursive case. And as it happens, you can have more than one recursive case as well. And I encourage you to make sure that you understand how to read recursive functions, that if I presented a, a recursive function to you, you can look at it and, and trace it out and see what steps it would be performing and on indication. And again, using the scoping diagram and function call chains, it right, really helps with that. And, uh, scope diagrams. Just like the ones we've been doing in class. Right. Okay. It's unlikely that I'll ask you to draw a scope diagram, but it's very likely that you'll want to draw a scope diagram to see what's going on with a recursive function, actually just trace out the call chain and to see what's, what's actually going to happen when that function is called. Okay. And then lastly, as I noted, I may ask you to write to a recursive function from scratch. Right? If so, that would, it would very likely be fairly, uh, fairly straightforward, nothing too uh, tedious or cumbersome. And something like our examples, like the Fibonacci sequence or factorial, something, something along those lines of complexity. All right, guys, any, any final questions? All right, well, I will see you on Monday. Right? We are out of time.